So einen. So, a wonderful evening to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Heinrich Boll Stiftung to this event. My name is Walter Kaufmann, and I uh, manage the work here for the South and Eastern Europe. I'm very happy that so many of you have come here despite the summer heat. I really thought that, you know, if I'd I was really wondering whether I'd come to a public, you know, disc event here at the Belstift um, because it's so nice outside. But it's a very important and uh, significant topic. So we, during the day, we already had uh, an expert conference on the same topic. And I can say that the discussions and the, the findings on Serbia and Kosovo that the two unfinished states 20 years after the war, you know, we were rather prudent afterwards. The title, you know, unfinished states, of course, we were deliberately provocative, but there are, you know, sort of like there are lots of reasons to talk about to talk about Kosovo as an unfinished state because of the lacking and uh, lacking international recognition and also for Serbia. There is an unresolved border question and also the establishment of institutions has similar problems, is confronted with, is confronted with uh, similar problems to Kosovo. That's why we wanted to, you know, compare both states and put them beside one another. Kosovo is a state which in the last, has established institutions in the last 20 years. Kosovo is a state albeit uh, with uh, we had people here from Kosovo today because, you know, sort of like there is a lot of clientelism and a lot of, you know, sort of like fair and free elections, uh, you know, that don't really change the current pol uh, political elite. But over the last few years, Serbia has a uh, has become more hardline and authoritarian in politics with lots more nationalistic ret rhetoric and bigger problems for the media and a public mood and which we also heard about today which is you know getting a little bit more warmongering uh, like and war ready and last but not least 20 years after the war we also have lots of insecurity with respect to the European perspectives for both states, for Kosovo and for Serbia. First of all, because of the lots of problems within the regions, the many conflicts, problems with uh, nations, but also, and not least, because we're also so unsure ourselves and a lot of a lot of people are unsure about the fate of the European Union itself and the, you know, what's happening with the European extension and integration process. The EU doesn't really have a credible extension expansion policy. Uh, you know, the, there isn't really unity within the major European states about the West Balkans. Do we really want Servo, Kosovo and uh, Albania in the EU, or are they just paying lip service to the idea, which means that there is uh, actually quite a difficult situation, but there is also, and in the Bell Stiftung, we're all very proud of our contacts to the many young people that in the that in Kosovo and Serbia, where there's a lot of young people who are bringing about political change, we have heard a lot of uh, we have heard a lot of uh, suggestions about Serbia and Kosovo uh, coordination, about the the environment, about uh, transport and infrastructure. Of course, there's no there's no right and no reason to be resigned about things, and so I would like to go. I would like to give the floor now to Bodo Weber from the Policy Council, and we have had uh, we we uh, designed and organised this event this evening, and as he's also in a regional uh, network, we've been able to use his contacts very often. Thank you very much, Bodo, and also thank you to your guests that you've all come today to Rudiger Hossip, who who is going to do the moderation of today's event. And 
And uh, thanks as well to the Deutsche Welle, to the editors there. And they will also contribute here today. So thank you very much to all of you. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And in my own name and of the Democratization Policy Council, thank you very much for having come to discuss this uh, this warm summer evening to come to the Heinrich Bosch Stiftung and to discuss this topic. I'm not going to really contribute a lot to what the last speaker has just said about why we're organizing this uh, event this evening. And there was a closed uh, expert event before this evening event talking about Kosovo, Serbia, and the EU. My organization is is involved as a civil uh, civil society organization for the spread of Western democracy. And we are working for, you know, about 15 years in the West Balkan region. And we are also involved with the EU expansion policy. Our uh, work is politically and focused on two major themes, two key European uh, themes, which which have been a bit lost over the last decade with the crisis. Where, is the e where does Europe start and finish? Where, and where does the EU start and finish? How should it be constituted? And, you know, as a political union, for example. And in that context, and, and in the topic that we're going to be involved in this evening on the panel, uh, we're going to address some of the most uh, serious uh, most of the most serious topics is the inheritance from the Balkan Cre war and conflict. And then the, we're also going to talk about the Serbia-Kosovo uh, conflict we've seen over the last 18 months, an unusual turn of events. Uh, and it's become extraordinarily successful, you know, after a crisis of the last decades. And the initiatives of 2011, 2012 from Berlin and from London and also from, you know, the Chancellor's Office and from the government. We tried to find uh, uh, an end to the conflict and set up a political uh, and the April agreement 2013, uh, which, you know, sort of like hasn't really been given, uh, done justice to, but or try to rec reconcile people, but at least to change the narrative in Serbia, where people are starting to say we have to recognize what we really know what reality is, is that Kosovo is no longer as part of Serbia, and we have to have a part of political recognition and adaptation to reality. And in order to find a peaceful solution, a durable stabilization of the region, and also with the perspective of Serbia within the EU. Over the last 18 years, we've had a complete uh, uh, reversal of fortunes in these discussions that were, there was a sort of like a stage-wise political dialogue and inclusive integration of Kosovo Serbian uh, min minorities in the Kosovo state and the negotiations about an end uh, treaty or, you know, sort of like were practically you know, sort of like what was in the 90s was part of the first, which was the the territorial uh, solution and talking about territorial exchanges. But this is so directly connected with the West and to the EU. We can also see reflected to the developments that we can also see in the EU and in the West as, as the, the internal crisis within democracy in the West and the return to political concepts of, you know, sort of like ethno-nationalistic movements of the 20th century, which are, you know, not just taking place within the West Balkans, but also within the heart of the West itself and in the EU. And uh, a lot of people are uh, proponents of, the, of these type of political solutions also within the West and the EU. This uh, wonderful change is uh, getting us this is we're trying to bring this to an end for what started in the 90s and we don't want to bring the region unnecessarily into instability and it's the you know over the last year and a half we've uh, we've sort of like 
started to find a solution for this with a mini limit between the the German and French governments, and there should be a follow-up meeting in July. And uh, like I said, it seems to have taken a turn because, and what's what are the consequences of going of all of this going to be? for a return to a sensible negotiation process. That's what we're going to talk about this evening. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much for to the Heinrich Böll Stiftung to have uh, made this possible. Thank you very much. My name is Miloš Savic. I was born in 99 in Kruševac. The fact that I was born in 99 means that uh, even if I was born during the bombing and during the war, I don't remember any of it. And my generation, 99 and so on, is like the perfect generation for peace building because uh, we don't remember the conflict. Over there, they made the round trip here, they entered here, and the general, two generals from the Serbian side and one general from the NATO, NATO command signed the, the so-called command of agreement. Hello, I'm Pleona. I was born in 99. I'm from Kosovo. The project uh, Generation 99, it was good to me because I met uh, new people and we have fun together. My name is George Bakoc. Uh, I think that project Generation 99 is a really good project that should uh, bring together the two sides and uh, we had really fun time with our Albanian friends and I think that this is some good thing and it, that this should continue on going forward. Not just this project but many more projects like this because obviously we had good time and there is a positive energy, so it's a good thing to have and to be a part of. Hello everybody, greetings from Kumanovo in North Macedonia. We are here in the city of North Macedonia, close to the Serbian and Kosovo border which was the historic place where the Kubanovo Agreement has been signed 20 years ago. We just developed a very interesting and inspiring debate with young, young people from Kosovo and Serbia who were born in 1999, exactly 20 years ago, in the year where the population of Serbia, but mainly the Kosovo uh, population, suffered from the Kosovo War. And uh, the project Deutsche Welle has been developing uh, on this occasion was exactly with the spirit to bring young people together to uh, let the people discuss who are uh, able and to, who are in the position to build the future. And what we learned from the project and, and from the discussion which we have been developing here in the municipality of Kumanovo, but also from our social media platforms during the last weeks, is that this young generation is fit for the future. They are willing to overcome the prejudice. They are over. Uh, they are willing to overcome the conflicts. And I think we have to support the young generation to uh, enable them to do so.
Jackson. So thank you very much for paying attention to the film. No, I'm here. Thank you very much for paying attention to the film. I think it was, you know, self-explanatory. The only thing that we didn't explain was the lady who was the blonde lady at the end, who is our manager, Adelaide Falk, who didn't uh, introduce herself. The film was uh, turned yesterday, so so you'll remember the 11th of uh, June was the date when Generale Donato and the Serbian RV, you know, signed their uh, sign that they dropped their weapons and the, the war came to an end. So today we're 20 years later and it's sitting here in uh, warm Berlin. And as you've already heard this afternoon about Servio, Servi, Serbia and Kosovo, two unfinished uh, states. And but it's not just a criticism, it's also a discussion. And I really must say that in the 20 years, a lot of things have happened, but not a lot of positive things over the last year. We had a change of the dialogue for at least uh, where I thought that we were going towards uh, mutual recognition between Serbia and Kosovo to have normally neighborly relations, uh, normally relations for the citizens of this uh, regions. But in fact, we've had, you know, sort of like a, a reversal or a return to the 90s uh, in terms of discourse where suddenly we were talking about border changes, you know, divisions of territories, you know, according to ethnicity. And, you know, everything which isn't really sort of like, a, you know, it's a citizen type, but a political solution, but an ethnic pollution. So like, I think you can going to introduce my panelists, uh, ex-Yugoslavian uh, uh, diplomat and a human rights activist, as one says in English, and then um, a politic politician and also in Kosovo, and also seeing uh, since I've been working with this, like Sonia, were active in this area, and we all we also have uh, from the F German Foreign Ministry, uh, Mrs. Stör. So, so what do you think about this return to the ethnic ethnicity oriented politics, Mrs. Bissako? And can you tell us a little bit about the Belgrade side of things? This curious. Uh, returns, you know, sort of like the the Fachi, Vucic, uh, Mogherini. How does the Troika work? We don't really know what type of plans are on the table. What's behind all of this? So what's the Belgrade secret part of the talks? Ah, okay. Sorry. Well, I was not surprised by this development because uh, partition of Kosovo was always uh, an option for Belgrade. And I think uh, the Brussels Agreement, which was uh, at, in, at its first uh, earlier phase, was rather positively uh, received even by the Serbian community in Kosovo. Like, this is something that we have learned while working with them a few months ago. But uh, for the Serbian political, intellectual, cultural, Elites, Kosovo was really uh, something to com to play with and compensate uh, with uh, Republika Srpska in Bosnia, because this was really the main ambition of Serbian elites, and this came up on the table as a result of disengagement of the EU, and also by uh, penetration of Russia in the region in 2014-15. So they have, in a way nourished this delusion that Serbian elite was uh, uh, having all these years. And therefore, this uh, uh, secret or under the table negotiations about uh, swapping of territory was no surprise for Belgrade. From my point of view, the surprise was really the drama got part of it because uh, Belgrade was always looking to Tirana for a partner on for the partition of Kosovo. And that was the earlier very often indicated by our main ideologue uh, towards the end of the 20th century, Dobrica Čosić, who is not only writer, but also an ideologue, ideologue, very influential, who was always saying that Albanians have right to unite, but that also uh, is the right of the Serbs to unite, uh, meaning in the first place on Mon the you know, Bosnia, Republika Srpska, and Montenegro especially. So. Uh, when this started, it was obvious that Brussels agreement was also 
totally obstructed in its implementation. And unfortunately, this had also support of the international lobby group, very prominent people, many of them engaged in some diplomatic missions in the region, like uh, Wolgan Petrich, like Blair, like um, um, Ambassador Manter, who was ambassador in Belgrade, uh, Soros' son, Alex Soros, uh, many other, how sh I would say, analysts like Ivan Krastev, Ivan Vojvoda, and many others. So this was, uh, in a way, almost uh, successful. They legitimated this option, and it's still on the table, unfortunately. Uh, we heard our president yesterday saying that um, he is in favor of compromise, which is a formula for the partition. So uh, I think they also play on differences uh, in the Western uh, international community. So he said, uh, I'm more online, I'm more aligned with the United States and France, but uh, the problem for me is United Kingdom and Germany. So he's uh, always playing with this sort of... Uh, uh, differences and of course they have this support of Russia but not so really uh, direct because Russia keeps the position that uh, they um, follow the line of uh, UN resolution 1244 and they say what Serbia decides that's what we are going to support. So therefore it is really uh, that local leadership in the meantime started to manipulate international uh, actors because until 2012 it was almost impossible to think that such an option would uh, be on the table, though it was always uh, somehow a wishful thinking of the Serbian elites. But wasn't it the same Mr. Vucic who a few years ago said together with other Serbian politicians who were actually not of that ideology that it was time to forget about Kosovo and uh, find a solution? How is it possible that he made this change, this turn? Well, you, you, you cannot say that uh, he was very sincere about it. On the other side, Kosovo also serves for the political elite in Serbia to generate nationalism and to, keep in, to stay in power. So that was done before him and now. So this is also one aspect of the Kosovo issue. It's, uh, apparently, Serbian uh, population or Serbian citizens are aware that Kosovo is lost. Already in 2008, when Kosovo declared its uh, independence, there was an uh, on-the-table uh, option whether you uh, vo vote against the association agreement with EU or you are in favor of Kostunica's position at that time, who was very much against the uh, independence of Kosovo and who organized these massive um, protests. But uh, in a way, I think uh, citizens in Serbia are more concerned with their social and economic well-being, and in this respect, they think uh, European Union is something that can bring around the changes. That doesn't mean that uh, they widely uh, embrace uh, Western values, which means rule of law, tolerance, and all that. It's a highly intolerant society, I would say. And, you know, uh, when talking about uh, sincerity of um, uh, our president, he has full control of the media in Serbia and who could, uh, of course, organize or spin uh, support for the EU option, but he didn't do that. On the other side, our media on a daily basis denounces the EU as something which is over, which is anti-Serbian, and, you know, they always uh, uh, spin this theory about special war against Serbia, which is uh, in friendly relations with Russia and, also, and all, all such, I would say, uh, interpretations which are reflecting really the current international political situation. And of course, the way, very, very often they, when talking about uh, NATO intervention, they never relate that to the crimes which were committed over Albanians in Kosovo. So NATO uh, intervention just came out of blue. And in fact, they are trying also to, considering this uh, Islamophobia in Europe and elsewhere in America, that uh, void Bosnia and in Kosovo was really war against Islamic uh, extremists and terrorists. So this is also something which they put now in the current uh, political context, trying to sort of uh, attract uh, support, let's say, official group, for example. So this is, uh, you know, they're always playing uh, with this uh, uh, aspect of the wars in the Balkans. Das war tatsächlich insofern so I wasn't surprised either um, considering the turn in the Belgrade uh, tone um, 
as was um, politics, for example. And I didn't feel reminded of the time 20 years ago, but 30 or 35 years ago, when a Serbian uh, ruler at the time said that all social problems in his country at the time in Yugoslavia uh, were linked to Kosovo or the Kosovo question. So is it like that? Is there such a close connection between the democracy deficit in the former Yugoslavia, in this case in Serbia, and the uh, issue of nationalism, or does it just seem like that? Uh, nationalism, we live with nationalism already for more than 30 years. It started with Milosevic, this radical nationalism. It only changed, changed forms in the meantime. It never ceased to exist, and it was uh, generated depending on what was on the agenda. So uh, Kosovo uh, really is not the main reason for... Uh, um, non-democratic developments in Serbia, but they use Kosovo as an excuse because uh, internal uh, human, I mean, society potential is very small at the moment uh, for the democratic changes and reforms. And I cannot say that we live in democracy considering uh, how poor is the rule of law, judiciary, media freedom, and uh, all other sort of criteria which uh, qualify the democracy. So I think we have reached a point where our political uh, elites are not able to deliver on the reforms and uh, democratic changes. And uh, we can say also that people, citizens in Serbia, are looking for the change, but they don't have a political representation which would be able to articulate a new agenda. And we have a lot of uh, uh, local initiatives. Well, we, we, we can say that it's very pluralistic in a way, but unfortunately there is no synergy. Doesn't mean that one, at one moment there won't be, but at this moment it's only some kind of uh, dissatisfaction, uh, delusion, uh, disillusionment with the... Uh, uh, so-called uh, multi-party system, disillusion with the uh, leadership, with party uh, life in general. But I must say that President Vucic, since he came into power, uh, did a lot to destroy political life, to discredit political parties, mainly, namely by blaming them for the corruption. This is what, uh, how he came into power. And also to discredit each individual leader by spinning all kinds of stories about them. So the people don't really trust political elites at this moment. So we have on one side uh, uh, opposition which is trying to get organized very poorly for the time being, and the citizens who walk uh, every Saturday already for six months without really coming to the point uh, uh, to expect any kind of changes. So this is uh, the general picture of where, what, what we live now. The demonstration in the and the protests give you the strange impression that half of Serbia comes together from the LGBT community to the right-wing nationalists without having an alternative program to what the government is actually doing. So looking at the situation from outside, from Germany or from Europe, uh, we get the impression that in Serbia there's actually only one position, which is Kosovo belongs to us and everything else doesn't matter that much. So are there also other positions in Serbia? Are there other ideas um, apart from land swap or um, separation based on ethical principles? Kosovo has a very important emotional uh, strength in Serbia nation, considering that first Serbian nation, the state was born in Kosovo and so on. But it's really, this emotion is continuously being uh, uh, spinned by media and, uh, you know, the systematic, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, campaign against uh, Kosovars, Albanians, and, you know, on one other side we are supposed to normalize relations, whereas on daily basis you have this vilifying of Albanians in general. So as a mafia state, it's criminals and this and that, as if we are sort of <laughs> full democracy and so on. So uh, this is uh, only on the emotional level, which is not something too uh, ir uh, how irrelevant. But on the other side, it's not really uh, what it is about what people in Serbia want. And of course, Russia has an important role in that because this anti-NATO campaign is inspired by Russians. It wasn't so fierce before 2013 and 14, but this is for their own reasons. So very often it seems as if a Serbian elite is really acting in the interest of Russia, not in the interest of Serbia. And this is really very disappointing because uh, NATO, uh, NATO is a very close partner of, the Serbia, of Serbia. We are in the partnership uh, with NATO, very high level of cooperation. But on the other side, uh, you have this Russian, uh, how should I say, um, 
push, which apparently is reminding Serbs that they should never pro uh, forgive or never forget what has happened in 1999. They have produced uh, a film on Balkan border, uh, which is now shown in uh, uh, Serbian cinemas about uh, NATO intervention, which is totally overdone and totally, I would say, uh, is counting on emotions of those who are going to watch it. And this is uh, uh, sort of keeping this issue open as long as they can, Russians. But of course, Serbian nationalistic elite, which is not small, I would say, with prevailing, they also use this as an argument against EU uh, orientation. So uh, I would say that the Serbian elites altogether are uh, generally against the EU and the Western uh, orientation of Serbia. It's not for the first time in the history. And I would say uh, we come to the point, really, where we have to define the, the character of our societies, uh, the values of our societies, and what is really the problem of the elite in the country, which is not able to step forward towards the European future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in Kristina, there was also uh, discussions about surprise about the border swap story. There was one person in the political elite who was for it, and then all the others were against it. But it's not really very transparent for us, and it's very important for us to see what's going on there. What, in your opinion, did happen? Let me give you a, a short version and a long version. The short version is that this was this guy who wanted to negotiate a land swap for his own per personal interests, and he more or less uh, cornered himself because no agreement can be made by one man and implemented by all people. It just doesn't happen. The long version is a story. Um, at, at this time, 20 years ago, I was hiding in Pristina. It was my 77th day of hiding. The bombing had started 77 days earlier. Uh, in the first night of the bombing, um, a friend of mine, Bayram Kilmendi, and his two sons were taken out by the police uh, to a, a place nearby and executed. Uh, after two weeks, fr another friend of mine, Femi Aghani, who was um, a very well-known intellectual, was also taken aside and executed. So I was hiding uh, for my life. And on the 77th day, I thought that maybe I could make it and maybe I could not make it. Uh, I could not make it because it was a time when uh, the Russians, the Russian soldiers, suddenly started getting into Pristina, driving from Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, and it was live on Serbian television that the soldiers were coming and uh, the armed uh, population, the Serb armed population, and the soldiers and the policemen, they started drinking and shooting uh, in the night, uh, waiting for the Serbian soldiers. A Serbian uh, neighbor in the house where I was uh, hiding uh, who was sympathetic to the family, he said, I cannot stand it anymore, I have to go. Um, uh, you will all be burned tonight. Uh, I cannot watch it with my eyes. And so we were waiting to be burnt uh, that night, and several houses were burnt. But fortunately, it stopped at some point. The Russians came in, there was a celebration, uh, there was shooting throughout the night until 3, 4 in the morning. And then the Brits came in like 10 a.m. or so uh, on the 12th uh, of June of 1999. Uh, I tell you the story because we have a difference in interpretations, not only on what happened on that day, but on facts. And uh, we have a difference of interpretations because the war is not over. The war in the minds of people is not over. The war is not over in my mind. The war is not over in other people's mind. And until a peace deal is reached, war will be in people's minds, and it will be part of the narrative. The kids you just saw who were 20, who are 20 and who were born in 99, they grew up in a narrative of war. And now there's an attempt to get them to a narrative of peace by Deutsche Welle. 
which is a good attempt. I'm just saying it is the duty of the political elites of Kosovo and Serbia to devise a narrative of peace, to move their societies to peace, and to get to a peace agreement. And this is a big framework. Now, within this big framework, you have attempts like this one of land swap, which not only is a attempt for peace, but it is an attempt for further wars. Because once you start moving people, because they are on the wrong side of the border, perceived wrong side by the, the elites, where do you stop? What is the moment in which you say, enough, this, is not the, this will not uh, reconcile? Once, and once you move people out because they are Albanian or Serb, do you start moving people because they are short or because of the sexual predilections? Will you have a non-gay uh, states because you will start exporting gays to some gay country? You know, where do you stop in devising these new borders and I instead of creating a um, inclusion, you start uh, actually excluding uh, people? Now, the land swap uh, deal is not only a product of the mentality of war, an unended war. It is also a product of intellectual laziness. It's, it's easier to get to these kinds of uh, easy, easy solutions. You know, kick out uh, 200,000 Serbs or kick out uh, uh, half a million Bosnian Muslims and, and find out how people can actually work together. Dictatorships are actually built on intellectual laziness. They are built on, on non-questioning these, uh, these truths. And so what is happening right now with the land swaps is a reflection of growing auth autocracies in our societies and state capture. Uh, an individual like Mr. Thachi, who happens to call himself our president, uh, is a, a guy who has been negotiating for over two years uh, on uh, land swaps on something that is extremely unpopular. 80%, for the first time, 80% of Kosovar Albanians and 80% of Kosovar Serbs are united on one subject. They do not want land swaps. Do you, sir, like you've nearly answered my second question by anticipation, uh, this discussion with the, you know, sort of like the democratization of Kosovo shows a lot about the problem of democratization, but it also shows that these overlaps between the sectors of the population that one didn't expect before. So be, you know, sort of like, uh, is there another, is there another position of the Kosovo elite besides saying that Kosovo belongs to us? Is there also another way of seeing things? Of course. I mean, we have to change the paradigm, and this is what we're trying to do intellectually, is the, in a very paradoxical way, the European Union, through Madame Mogherini, has been engaged in a non-European or anti-European project, which is legitimizing land swaps. Exactly, this, exactly the, the contra contrary to how the European Union was built. What we are saying is, why do, not, why do we not take the principles on which the European Union was built and try to uh, apply whatever is applicable to our societies? Now, what is the most important principle that has built the European Union? It is about not competing on territories, resources, people, land. It's about sharing. And now the transformation that ha needs to happen in our society is not how to engage in further negotiations on territory, on land, on people, on resources, in our case, on memory. Because what we have is a competition on memory. To whom does Kosovo historically belong? And my, my question is, why is not an Orthodox monastery my monastery as well? Why does it have to be only orthodox believers? And why cannot be, I be a culturally orthodox Kosovar who actually respects not only that religion, 
but also the architecture and also the spirituality that comes with it. Now, once we put that as a pattern, as a trend, uh, as a paradigm, we will get different results. The question is not how to get the Gaziboda Lake and who gets the Gaziboda Lake, because if you look at the Gaziboda Lake, for example, which is you know, 70 percent on the Kosovo side and and 30 percent on on the Serbian side, or less than that, you understand that you are reaching not only on questions of water and, and water supply, you're also reaching um, questions about economy because 40 percent of the of that water is used by agriculture in which Serbs and Albanians participate in Kosovo. That water uh, is used for cooling of the electrical uh, uh, powering uh, system. And ultimately, if there were no such water, we will enter an even more ecological catastrophe as, uh, and, and we, we live in a, a very r rather lousy environment. So the next question is how do we share the environment? Something that is uh, not even uh, 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 perceived or talked about in these talk in in these negotiations. You know, how do we understand that as a uh, a, a region of actually peace and of exchange and of movement and of freedom, not a, a place of competition? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sabine Stur, you lead the West uh, Balkan uh, Department of the Foreign Ministry and <coughs> were quite surprised, uh, you know, in Germany, the federal government, the chancellor, they, you know, they were really speaking for a non-ethnic solution for that part of Europe. And then there was suddenly this uh, surprising turnaround. So what's the perspective of the Foreign Ministry on this? What happened in the last year? So the question is, why did the dialogue progress in this direction? You know, you can speculate a lot, but I do think that there was uh, various reasons for this. But first of all, and there was a good analysis for this at the beginning, when the idea was uh, made public at the beginning, that uh, in a lot of administrations that, you know, people lived through the 90s and either as politicians or as diplomats and then they were working in the 90s and in the, the early 2000s they were working in, on the Balkan question and they had to reach some rather difficult discussion decisions but they're no longer the people they're no longer the people who are accompanying the lot, this process you know there are different bureaucratic theories but in Germany it was the case that we, through the fact that, you know, we were busy, we were busy with the Balkan crisis and the Kosovo crisis in the 90s, uh, but we grew up with this. So people, people have, you know, sort of like they have reflexes that are completely absurd. And also for the reasons that you've talked about here, it contradicts everything that we've done here in Europe. It contradicts all the European principles and the future that we see for the uh, West Balkan region, uh, you know, sort of like separation according to ethnic criteria. It cannot lead to anything positive. And, and you know, sort of like also, it's not something that we can understand in our uh, societies here. You know, sort of like we, you know, we've integrated people even from other ethnic backgrounds into our society. So it is absurd to progress in this manner. But here with us in our system, and this is also relevant for the, uh, for the, our ministry and for the government, not necessarily for the parliament. But, you know, sort of like I've never met anybody that, you know, sort of like likes this idea. First of all, we knew that, you know, sort of like it's an old idea. It's an outdated idea. It's something that... Uh, it's, you know, sort of like from the various, it was represented and defended by the various Serbian governments. And it's an idea that contradicts what we intended to do and contradicts the principles. Uh, you know, sort of like, you know, contradicts the fact as well that we've accepted Kosovo in independence and, you know, the acknowledgement and sort of like, you know, sort of like why 10 years after 2008, why have we decided suddenly that now is the point in time? 
where, you know, sort of like dialogue is broken down. Another there's no other possibility. It's uh, totally, you know, sort of like, okay, so it's totally, you know, arbitrary to just pick one little date uh, that one, you know, sort of like, it hasn't led to a recognition of uh, Serbia, but, you know, by Serbia, of Kosovo. And so we're just going to, you know, sort of like start separating land. But, you know, there has a, a certain attractivity that's been developed by people who think that they can find a quick solution, an easy fix to a problem. And they can, you know, sort of like, if, you know, they can collect uh, brownie points uh, for a gold star for a new job or, you know, also with respect to international court jurisdiction. So reasons are other reasons. But a lot of people have made a mistake. And, you know, it's not a, you know, it's not a surprise that this became attractive, you know, for the White House to solve a problem. You know, they, it seems to be a more quick fix type of White House. And I think they thought that it was implement, in, uh, that it was implementable. But we think it's not, imp we cannot implement it. And we think that even if we were to implement it, it's not going to lead to any positive results. And, and, but this is the way it is. So 29th of April, we had a meeting of the uh, the German Chancellor and the French President, and with the West uh, Balkan West Balkan leaders, government uh, heads of government, and also with the people from Serbia and Kosovo. But I really must say that I really expected, you know, sort of like a big bang from this conference. But it seems to be sort of like it's, you know, sort of like it's only been a it's been a weak squib, as it were. It's not not a very loud noise at all. Sort of like in July they're going to meet in Paris and discuss further. But what is behind this whole process? So, you know, if, if we're going to use the expression "big bang." But this is exactly our problem over the last couple of years. You know, so like people think that we have the golden key and now we're going to we're going to have the magic key to solve a very difficult problem. But then, you know, sort of like we, you know, sort of like we always talk about law and order and an orderly process would be different, like the Kazivoda Lake and the cultural inheritance or or other things or mem mem remembrance. But then people st people stop listening because it's not attractive. It's not you know, sort of like people prefer big bangs, an easy solution, uh, you know, golden key to solve, a, you know, magic, find a magic solution for a problem. And so people, you know, sort of like this is not meant as a criticism, but it really is the case that, that, you know, conflict resolution is a long and difficult pro process with very, very tangible negotiations and points that have to be discussed. And you cannot just, you know, sort of like, you know, br paint it with a broad brush and, and you know, sort of like if you hang out this supposed carrot and think that we're going to find, you know, sort of like a quick, a quick fix solution, you know, you get the independence and we'll, you know, we get land, you know, start us against territory. And that seems to be the label and it seems to be the, the you know, the slogan of the time. And... But, you know, people were thinking sort of like, you know, if it goes that direction, then it's not so interesting. You know, sort of like we have to sort out the customs questions. We have to build trust. We have to make sure that, for example, and, you know, so like we have to develop a, a positive direction for regional cooperation. We've had crises uh, with our flagship, the Berlin process for regional cooperation for the, you know, the RICO for the regional youth outreach. And uh, Kosovo had the presidency this year and there was an important meeting with resolutions about budgets and structure. And uh, this didn't happen because the Serbian delegation decided that they didn't want to have a meeting in the Kosovo parliament because it was it went against their sensitivities. So, you know, this is that the, the disc discourse is becoming more escalated, more hardline between both sides. And, you know, sort of like, I want to say, I don't want to defend us or defend our position here. You know, people can always do more or achieve more. But, but just as a pre remark, you know, that we don't have a golden key and there is no magic solution, so we can't use it. And if uh, we raised, you know, sort of like high expectations by saying to people that, you know, we're going to find a magic quick solution, then it's very, very hard to come back to a durable and sustainable uh, peace and reconciliation process. Um, the last meeting in Berlin was a one-off meeting with the representatives of the region, and it was extremely important to make it very clear to them that uh, not just in Kosovo, 
uh, that, you know, sort of like change, you know, sort of like that the whole region doesn't like the idea of border changes and land swaps. They really, really fear this. And, you know, sort of like this, that can only, that can only be, that can only be implemented if people are actually supported, and which isn't the case. And I think that we managed to bring our point across. And I think that this idea of, you know, border uh, land swaps, it, you know, sort of like comes to the surface every so often, and people try to suggest it as a possible solution. And in this context, there's this escalation that we can see uh, in Kosovo and between Kosovo and Serbia, sort of like, you know, there is the suspicion, you know, sort of like, you know, sort of like, look at this, you know, of course, you can't live together. So of course, we've got to find a radical solution of and sort of like, you know, cut off bits of land and separate things. But but it's become more clear that there is no chance to implement this very fast in, uh, you know, sort of like, you cannot have a land swap within this context. It was an object, this was the objective of the summit. And I think that we succeeded in bringing this point across. And the second point, is the negotiation process we have to we have to bring it back on track and then you know sort of like we've had you know sort of like difficulties in fixing objectives for our next uh, now we have these uh, punitive tariffs from the Serbian government we want to get this suspended or at least find a way forward and to make it possible to make it a subject of negotiation and to continue dialogue and make a progress. So I would agree to you with you that it's extremely important, you know, sort of like the, you know, it's like people, you know, who these people who have high explanations, high expectations, they think that it's an easy solution. And, you know, sort of like it's very, very hard to break people's uh, hopes. But is it, but is it, uh, you know, sort of like, is it uh, exaggerated, you know, sort of like to say that we, this was the was were the two high expectations with respect to Merkel and Macron, sort of like something some big bang has to happen, something's gotta happen. So like we said, they've said it before that the whole thing happened, you know, sort of like the normalization dialogue between two thousand and ten and the Brussels agreement in 2013 that was uh, mainly due to the support of the Bund the federal chancellor here. So it's uh, closely related in any case. Thank you very much. So what do you think? How what do you think about Kosovo? And what do you th how do you see this person? What do you are your personal perspective on the uh, just German French initiative? What chance do you ha think it has of succeeding? Succeeded um, in the sense that it started a transition from one process to the other. Um, the process that was led by uh, lately by Madame Mogherini uh, basically ended. Uh, it had some uh, some small results. It created more problems than results, uh, and it uh, brought itself to a natural end. Um, I think the natural end was actually this: was coming for uh, presidents of the region and prime ministers of the region to come to Berlin and to say look, we're, we're disgusted with land swaps, which is, I think, what happened in Berlin. People from Bosnia and people from Montenegro and people from Macedonia saying what sensible people ought to be saying, uh, which is that this is not a solution and it will hurt the region. So in that sense, the, sh the, sh the negotiations should not be seen as a, as a fast boat that moves uh, in zigzags. Uh, which is the analogy to quick fixes. You cannot get negotiations on a speedboat. Um, it's a rather more a tanker in our, in our case. And uh, what is happening now is that the, the tanker is slowly moving from one direction uh, to the other. In order to move faster, I think that both Serbia and Kosovo will be well advised uh, to entertain principles for a more serious negotiation, uh, for a negotiation that will conclude in peace and that will look forward and that will look beyond com competition and into sharing. And in that sense, um, I think the European Union, whenever it, it has a commission in, in the shortest possible terms, uh, will also be entertaining these ideas. I think what 
we would expect, what the region would expect from, from Germany and France, would be not only to create a habitat uh, for such developments, but also to engage in some idea sharing uh, on, on these issues. Of course, if the region generates ideas, if it does not generate ideas, these cannot be imposed uh, upon the region. Uh, so in that sense, I do not think that, that there will be a big bang. I, I, first of all, I did not expect a big bang in Berlin. I do not expect a big bang in Paris. For that matter, I do not expect a big bang in Washington. I think what will be happening is a, a s more serious, more integrated and deeper and more democratic process uh, in which uh, an authentic um, drive for peace uh, will actually deliver uh, a, an agreement. Sonia Bissako. So what do, you, what do you think about, can you give us the Kosovo perspective on the German-French initiative and process? Uh, that Germany and France as biggest states uh, in the EU have come together with this uh, initiative. And I agree that it won't be overnight uh, uh, the process which is just uh, uh, initiated now should bring more transparency in the process itself. And also, I would say, uh, send messages to both Kosovo and Serbia that uh, they have to stick to the European uh, values now if they really want to become part of it. And of course, for Serbia, it's not easy to turn back to the EU. Also, I think uh, Kosovo doesn't, never intended. But for Serbia, because we have this uh, very, how should I say, ambivalent position towards the EU, I think for any government, including this one, it would be very difficult to turn the back to the EU. It's, uh, because they see a lot of benefits from there and a uh, lot of support, which doesn't come from other sides. What I think is important in the coming phase is really to help revive economy in the region, because as long as we only depend on the uh, public sector for the employment, uh, which is turned into labor, into a party uh, labor market, uh, there won't be independent initiatives and independent uh, <coughs> citizens uh, either in Serbia or Kosovo. So I think parallel to installing democracy, rule of law, and other things, it's very important to have a regional revivement of economy, which will be a push towards the more, uh, how should I say, uh, vocal, uh, expression of the citizens uh, about the current state of affairs, which most of them disagree with. So I think uh, EU should really get engaged. We usually used to say that some kind of Marshall plan should be uh, implemented in the region, but something which would uh, <coughs> close down the world, the door to the <coughs> penetration of China and other how should I say, factors who are very untransparent and un uh, who deal in a very untransparent way, which also uh, is open to the, all kinds of corruption and all kinds of, uh, how would say, um, uh, dealings with the leaders uh, in these countries. So EU uh, help, uh, financial investment and so on, is something which uh, uh, abides with some kind of criteria, transparency and so on. I think this is what uh, one should expect from the EU in the next period. I was already wondering uh, that nobody mentioned uh, the M of money, because concerning what I would have expected from Berlin, I would have expected less an authoritarian approach of any Western leaders towards <laughs> the leaders of Kosovo and Serbia, but for instance talking about new motorways and loads of working places. But We've had now two, two little rounds on the stage, and I would like to open it up. Jetzt habe ich angefangen, Englisch zu sprechen. Verzeihung, ich hoffe, es ist alles mit übersetzt. Uh, now I started speaking English. I'm sorry. So I'm going to switch to uh, German again. So we had two rounds on the panel, and now I would like to open up the discussion for the audience. So have you any questions to our panelists? Super, danke schön. Vielen Dank, Herr Potremia. Ich habe... Um, Thank you very much. I've got a remark to make. So we all agree that the land swap uh, is not a good idea. And Mr. Osik, you said that this was um, a return to ethno politics. 
I had the impression that in 2015, with the community association, we already have seen a return to ethnic policies. We all recollect Dayton, and Mr. Stör, you said that it was an immediate reaction on the German side while we reacted it. Um, I think it was already the case in 2015. So there we have already seen this um, land swap according, or, uh, according to ethnicities. So I would like to know the uh, uh, view of the panelists. <clears throat> um, and also of the Foreign Office in terms of the community association. I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, for example, the Constitutional Court, just as an explanation, has found 20 or violations against 20 articles of this uh, community association, so against the whole Kosovo Constitution. And uh, I would like to hear your assessment if this is going to be on the table again. Thank you. So do we need some information for the public about what the Serbian Association of Municipalities is? It's a community of the Serbian communities in Kosovo, is, uh, which is like a state-type structure. If you want to see it critically, the Serbian state doesn't see it like this. They think it's uh, that it's sort of like an interstate uh, connection. Uh, correct me about the correct, the exact status. But uh, but it's a Serbi, Serbian Bosnia, but inside Kos Kosovo. So should we answer, or do you, do you want another question? He's not speaking into the microphone, so I can't hear, unfortunately. So first of all, we'll answer this question. Who'd like to start? interpretations uh, on this sort of association agreement. And I think this was the major problem between the negotiations as long as they lasted. First of all, uh, Serbia sees uh, this as a status of Republika Srpska, I would say. And this is exactly what uh, Albanians are fearing from. And this is why they are so unwilling to engage in this kind of uh, uh, further negotiations and after all once they started uh, talk talking about swapping of territory uh, it was uh, the discussion about the association was stopped as well and uh, serbia serbs have uh, come up with some kind of the proposal which was never sent to brussels after this uh, uh, how should I say uh, swap of territory discussion started so i i, I think uh, the kosovo already has a law which relates to all municipalities in Kosovo, and by that law, they have right to some kind of autonomy, and it doesn't. It allows any any municipality in Kosovo to sort of exercise this kind of autonomy. So I I, I don't know. This is something because the Akhtistari plan, which is partly incorporated in Kosovo constitution, is really going beyond the line which would be uh, functionable in such a small state as the Kosovo. So I think this has to be redefined or rediscussed in a way that would, uh, first of all, uh, enable the Serbian community to uh, stay in Kosovo and to, have, to keep this sustainability, but also to allow Albanians sort of to control the whole territory. This is really what it is about, the integrity of Kosovo. Yes, uh, the, the example of these community associations, it gives you an impression of the dialogue that's happened. We did have agreements and uh, they, yeah, they were very ambivalent. And of course, you know, sort of like, you know, sort of like you have to be in the middle in order to have a, you know, a conversation. But this isn't a co this isn't a criticism. You know, first of all, you've got to meet, you've got to start talking, and then you've got to make things a little bit less ambivalent to have a constructive dialogue. But there were a lot of these agreements which properly weren't discussed properly, and whether they were with Serbians and the and first of all, if you want to talk to this, you know, sort of like. You know, sort of like you know, sort of like you can see them saying, you know, how long they haven't, uh, you know, they made an agreement and then they took they they took the word back the next day. And if you're looking at the Kosovo negotiators, that says uh, we did, we agreed on this, but we did say only 
only when it doesn't violate the Kosovo constitution. And so now there's been a decision of the constitutional court, which is saying that uh, these agreements uh, violate the constitution. And so we cannot implement this in Kosovo. So it's a very good example for this. So, you know, sort of like you can... You know, sort of like people, you know, people come to agreements and they agree things, but then afterwards then they all return home and that they can tell the diverse public and electorate, they can just tell them that, you know, sort of like what they can, they could just do whatever they'd like. But it meant that there wasn't really progress made. The Serbian Association of Communes, when they talk about subsidiarity, when you're talking about uh, you know, sort of like about, you know, taxes, you know, being kept within a region that, the, you know, sort of like there should be cultural rights and other rights. And, uh, you know, sort of like in uh, when the when there's a majority, then they should also be taken into hand by them, the ethnic minority. Sort of like, on the other hand, that can be also be a good way to, uh, to uh, you know, sort of like a very good uh, shared common way of living. Uh, but, you know, so like if it makes the Kosovo state more dysfunctional, when you suddenly you've got an entity that starts getting involved in foreign policy, for example, or in other state, uh, you know, so like when they've got a blocking right or a veto right, uh, then it'll lead to a dysfunctional Kosovo state. So we didn't deal with the, we didn't deal with it and as a topic as such. But we sort of like said that to a Kosovo the question is how it's going to be built up. And like Mr. Bazarko said, uh, we have to see how it's designed and put into place. And it doesn't matter whether the state is big or small at the end of the day, it's, it just has to be functionable. Yes, I, I agree. It was a, a negotiation that was not set up on principles. And therefore, anything that was agreed was considered a principle in itself. And what the delegations did in 2013, even earlier, was to agree to a Brussels agreement in which they, one of the principles to which they agreed was a territorial autonomy for Serbs in Kosovo under the name of Association of Serbian Municipalities. Now, the question is, can you add another form of governance within Kosovo? And you cannot in the constitution. But in a, in a negotiation, you can add it in a constitutional process. And if a, in a sovereign Kosovo, uh, the, the uh, parliament of Kosovo voted for a Serbian autonomy, it would be established. But it is not going to be established in a negotiating process. The principles that were driven, the driving force of the principles were ethnic at the time. And that's why we came to the land swap. One illustration, in in the agreements, a the the head of the police of Mitrovica North and the region has to be a Serb. Now it does not say representing the majority communities or representing the ethnic composition or whatever. No, it says it has to be a Serb. Now what would happen if an ethnic Muslim, an ethnic Turk, a, a gypsy, would say a Roma? would say, wait a minute, my rights are not respected. Why cannot I be a police commander? And take this to Strasbourg, to the European Court of Human Rights. He would win, of course. Uh, the other agreement that was made was said that the composition of the, co the, of the court in Mitrovica North has to be majority Serb, again, the appellate court. Now, how can you have an ethnic composition of, 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 of judges in, in, in the court? How can you decide that it has to be a Serb? What if you had a, a, a Serb feeling like an Eskimo and declaring himself as an Eskimo, uh, but defending Serbian rights more than anybody else or defending the rights because a, a, a judge has to defend rights uh, regardless of their ethnic composition? What if this guy was the best uh, judge in, in the world, but he cannot win because he's not a Serb, because he declares himself as an Eskimo? Uh, th these nonsenses that were integrated into the Brussels process produced then the end result. And the end result was, if you can get away with this, why can't you get away with land swaps? And bad deals have two, at least two bad outcomes. The first one is they cannot be implemented. And second, 
they make further deals more difficult. Because once you have bad deals, you start uh, doubting on the uh, ability to, to reach a deal with the other side. And this is uh, the negative product of the Mogherini process after an initial positive product, which was getting the two sides together, starting to actually think about uh, uh, reaching agreements. I'm a politi political scientist and a journalist. Uh, you've said that, Felon Soro, you've said that there is like we've got to start working on finding a constructive solution and trying to agree with consensus on the other side. I'm asking you all as panelists, I'm wondering. Uh, how do you comment the fact the declarations of this of the Serbian prime minister um, uh, who after the discussions with the Albanians who said that you know the Albanians all come from the woods you know sort of like how can we find a constructive solution and a con constructive conversation when on one side when there's a uh, political decision makers who makes this type of uh, declarations. I mean, uh, Mrs. Uh, Bonovich, everybody knows that she's a lesbian, and even she knows exactly what it's like to be stigmatized and discriminated against and hated in a country that has a very negative approach to the LGBT community. And I have the feeling that uh, a lot of people are dealing with, you know, de sweeping this under the carpet and dealing with the uh, dealing with it silently, and also wondering why the international community is sweeping this under the carpet and not reacting to it. And I hope that the I hope that the Foreign Office doesn't hate me, but but I but I think that the I think that the Foreign Office and the German government also close their eyes with respect to this declaration. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, sort of like Talleyrand said that, you know, dip diplomats never get angry, they just take notes. But it gives me the opportunity of saying, of course, uh, I, I have seen a lot of about this declaration. I've seen, uh, you know, sort of like Kosovo women who sort of like say, you know, I come from the woods, you know, sort of like I saw a lot of very humorous reactions to this, at least in the, you know, they, you know, it, it really kind of, you know, d the bubble burst over the social media. So I don't think you need to comment this, but you are absolutely right that not just this declaration, but also lots of other declarations. Uh, do not sound as if one is really intends to find peace or to seek reconciliation. And I think that this type of message, we always send this message to both sides, but I think a little, little bit more, uh, you know, sort of like I think that more applies to the Serbs, that in order to have a successful process, uh, you know, sort of like we need to we need to tone the rhetoric down a little bit and we don't uh, you know we don't uh, we have to show our populations that we need to find a solution and I think in English you'd say civility and you know an American diplomat already said this before that that it sh when people are civil to one another then it shows that we really want reconciliation and you know sort of like you know sort of like not you know, so like we don't need to talk about, you know, war in the newspapers about uh, against the Albanians all the time. So that's just to say with respect to your question, we already do bring this message across and we make it very clear to both sides. Being LGBT doesn't mean by definition to be liberal, I would say. So our <laughs> prime minister is uh, uh, just, she just crystallized uh, the rhetorics which is ongoing uh, all these years or these decades. And she's not the only one in the government. You have the Minister of Defense, uh, Foreign Minister. They're all, uh, in a way, there to speak out against Albanians on a daily basis. Now also President Vucic, who is uh, um, sending message to Kosovo that uh, we don't depend on you, you depend on us. And not only you, but the whole region. So this is a kind of uh, arrogance uh, uh, 
which is uh, built on this feeling that we are superior in the region and that, that somehow we are um, uh, the, the main factor and, uh, of stability and disability and that everything depends on us. So it's not, it was not surprising, but uh, so it is surprising that a woman said something like that. And of course, it was the top of this, how should I say, rhetoric which is there on a daily basis. Well, there are, there are two things to it. The, the first one is that we have to reach peace with not necessarily friends. Uh, it's actually people who have very different opinions of, of each other that get to peace. Um, and so uh, many people may hate uh, Albanians, uh, but ultimately they will have to get to a point in which they sign a peace agreement with Kosovo. The second is that this statement is actually much smaller in significance than the actions that Serbia has undertaken. And let me take an, a simple illustration. There are 1,800 missing people. And over the last 20 years, uh, the Serbian state has not dealt in a necessary and uh, satisfactory way in a way that will show basic humanity on the question of the missing people. Uh, the missing people are much, much more important than whatever Brnavic says about the mountains or the hills or the sea or whatever she, she will invent. Um, and I think a degree of mutual, uh, not only respect, but a <coughs> sharing of uh, basic uh, um, respect for humanity is if we both sides uh, agree initially that whatever we will be talking about we need to talk about the missing people first or to be at the top of our priority we cannot let the people and missing people are all across the ethnic spectrum you have missing roma missing turks missing muslims missing serbs missing albanians these are members of family that leave war still going on in their lives. You know, I've, I've spoken several times, and let me illustrate this to you now. There's a lady called Ferdonia Cerchesi. She lost her husband and four sons in the war. In May of 99, her, her, her husband and her sons were taken from home, and they were executed. Uh, she recovered only two of the bodies. She's waiting for the three bodies. Every night, in their memory, she puts a table for the dinner. Every night for 20 years, awaiting for the, her kids. This is war going on in her mind. This is war going on in the Serbian family's mind. There's a girl called Radmila Živanović. She was six years old. At the end of war, three days after the war ended, she stayed with her mother, her mother was killed, and she was killed. This is a war going on for the whole community, not only for Radmila and for her mother and for, uh, for grandfather. And this is a question that needs to be addressed. We need to get deeper than the scratches that some Bernavich or anybody else will do. Dacic will go, will invent stupidity. Well, I'm sorry, I should not say this. Dacic will not say very intelligent things uh, every day. Uh, but that should not hurt us. That should, that, those are scratches in comparison with the real pain. And the real pain of our societies is that war has not ended. Yeah, my name is Axel Hoffmann. I'm Axel Hoffmann. I have a question, which isn't really a question, I suppose. But it's uh, everything was, you know, sort of like it's about what was negotiated. I'm just going to make an inappropriate comparison. I can remember the 1960s in our countries, in our country here, where the narrative was wrong and how long it took until the German society, but also the societies in the east, the eastern of Europe, could move. And it, it lasted longer than 20 years. It, you know, sort of like it started with us in 65, I think. So I wanted to... Isn't it possible that the societies need more space and more time to develop in order to be able to talk with each other more constructively? Oh, 
statement. I, I have read a lot about uh, Germans facing the overcoming the past and other nations, uh, Europe-wide and Asia-wide and so on. And indeed, it is a transgenerational process. But we have to start from somewhere. The problem is that we have ongoing war. We didn't finish the war. So, and this is why it is a problem that uh, Vuitton is talking about, that uh, sometimes, somewhere you have to put a full stop, which would be the starting point for the process you are talking about. So I would say when we talk about Serbia, we don't uh, acknowledge anything, any of our responsibility. War in Croatia was uh, revenge, war in Bosnia was liberation of Serbs, and war in Kosovo was war against terrorists. So this is the qualification or interpretation that we have. We, as a Serbia, we are not at war. We are surrounded by hostile countries and hostile West. There is a special war against us and so on. You have a whole theory which is being developed as an excuse for not being able to face uh, and acknowledge realities of the Milosevic's legacy. And unfortunately, uh, current political elite is, was part of the Milosevic's apparatus uh, which uh, conducted the war in, uh, for, in Yugoslavia. And they didn't change their minds. On the contrary, they are continuing, some, uh, rhetorically speaking, the same kind of uh, aggression against the region. And, and this is the problem. Not, I don't expect that... Uh, uh, you know, reconciliation will take place. It is the uh, last phase in this very long process. But we have to have the starting point, which we don't have. There are two, there are two important um, differences. Uh, well, many different, but, but two, two that I would note uh, at, at this occasion. The first one is that uh, regardless of what happens in societies, evolution in societies, elites have a certain responsibility. And political elites uh, in Germany, in France, uh, Italy, uh, after the war, took upon themselves a responsibility to drive their societies, uh, to lead their societies out of hatred. And this is, it, it's not only the political societies, you had a great intellectual debate in, in this country, uh, leading this country out of, uh, out of the paranoias and the hatreds uh, of dictatorship, and still have. And, and the second is that there needs to be a framework of a stronger party that helps uh, nurture, support those leaders to move ahead. And, the United States recognized its historic role at the time with the Marshall Plan and helped uh, create the framework so that uh, the, the leaders of France and Germany and Italy, etc., uh, move ahead uh, beyond, beyond what they had, uh, uh, beyond their expectations. You know, if you compare, you had the Treaty of Rome 12 years after the war. Now, 12 years after our war, we didn't have anything let alone a treaty, you know, it's, if, if, if we had, if the rhythm that we have applied in search of peace were applied to European, to, the, to Germany, France, to the European Union countries, in 1965, you would have decided that you will let the Munich registration plates cross into, into France and the, the, the Paris registration plates uh, uh, cross uh, uh, into uh, Berlin uh, eventually, but uh, not, not with the state uh, emblemas, because this is what we decided. We had an historic agreement, Kosovo and Serbia, to let the registration plates cross the borders, but w uh, to put a sticker on the state em em emblemas. Hello, Felita Suka is my name. I am a political scientist and I did my study in 1990, just a couple of weeks after the end of the war. And of course, there were seminars on the topic. And, you know, people were, people had the, the analysis or the perspective, the weakness that the weakness of civil societies really contributed to the fact that there was this ethnic conflict, that it lasts, that, it, you know, sort of like, you know, sort of like the, you know, the family, 
there, were, there was a very, very weak civil society in spite of the fact that there were close family relationships. Now, just to my, to my question, 20 years later, we, we knew, we knew that, you know, that civil society is a strong process in democratization, but maybe we haven't done enough uh, from the outside to help you develop. Maybe we should have done a lot more to reinforce civil society, to help them play the real role in order to sustainably avoid conflict. and so that it won't lead to ethnic conflict. Maybe we didn't do enough, and maybe I can hope that if one, if one reinforces the civil society, could we find a sustainable and durable solution for this conflict in the region? You know, so like besides the economic question, which of course plays a central role, but the question of civil society that should be reinforced, and maybe we didn't do enough. Maybe we should have done more, invested more in this area. So Walter Kaufmann from the Bell Stiftung. My question is uh, similar. The relationship between, between conflict resolution and democratization, we talked about this during the day. The EU in the negotiations with Serbia and in the accession uh, negotiations, there were th they opened three chapters, uh, 23 and 24, I think, the form of justice, uh, democracy questions, and the additional qu uh, chapter 35, where they wanted to exert pressure on normalization of relationships with Kosovo. And uh, one often has the impression that on the Serbian side, that chapter 35 was used in order to put pressure on the EU. Uh, that they were sort of like we were taken hostage in this uh, process of normalization between Serbia and Kosovo. And for this reason, uh, you know, sort of like with the rule of law and uh, we weren't able to get further and with respect to, so with the, when uh, Germany has the EU presidency next year, do you think that people will say, uh, okay, you know, sort of like uh, normalization, reconciliation with Kosovo, if you don't have any good so solutions, then we're going to concentrate, first of all, for two years on the, not just on chapters 35, but on the inner chapters and the ones that touch on the rule of law and democracy in Serbia, the other chapters that deal with this. from uh, North Macedonia, I'm Albanian. And uh, my question is, uh, so I think uh, the Euro European Union, it's not really serious in our problems. Uh, like, I, I feel discriminated in my country at first, then second. Also, uh, Serbians did a lot of bad things to Kosovo, then, uh, they want uh, they wanted from Kosovo to change territories with Montenegro. Kosovo did. Mokherini was playing bad bad games, bad politics, and Kosovo has nothing. Then in the in the end, why we have to wait to solve our problems? United States, we are part of Europe. So I think the problem is European Union needs to be more serious and to be a fair player. I guess I would add a round of answering. Probably you want to answer first. Does that immediate? Okay. Nur ganz kurz, ich finde. I find I'm Hartmann Toff. I've been able to observe the process over a long time that in a lot of these uh, topics, that there's an enormous uh, ideological pressure which is exerted from all sides. And when you look at the historic experience, uh, you know, the territorial exchange is fits and forced with violence between Greece and Turkey in the 20s, a long time ago, or the, or the separation, an ethnic separation between, be, between Germans and Czechs, Germans and Poles, that 
you know, sort of like made it possible that we were able to work with one another in a reconciliatory manner, but it took a long time. But I think that the political education, the, the working on the processing of one's own history, you know, what role does Dobrycha Cocic play? Or, or a non-functioning state like bosnia Herzegovina, or with the Republic of Skopje, where, you know, which is making pressure and these, you know, sort of like we must learn from the, the experience of the European neighbors. And we have to also have not just an, not just an economic Marshall plan or sort of like, you know, investing or building motorways, but we also have to invest in the ideology. I think the Generation 99 is a wonderful project. And we had something similar to this in the Central Europe, where all of the youth and the came together and they started working and they started dancing together. But they also started working. The international work camps were set up then. And it was fantastic work. And it brought people together from the different countries sort of like I'm not you know sort of like I'm not talking to him because he doesn't like Germans or because he don't like Poles or Finns etc and I think that this model we really should try to roll it out and try to sue, support it intensively so civil society yes of course it's extremely important I do think that there are a lot of support measures and a lot of movements uh, that existed and do exist to support civil society, but you can only attempt to find the best possible criteria for this. But, but then, of course, in the countries themselves, uh, there must be a raising of awareness where people uh, look after their own business. Uh, we've set up a whole series of projects that we've supported where it didn't just uh, concern political questions or reconciliation, but just where you could you could resolve or discuss uh, common problems, like things that you have, like the environment or or municipal topics, and you know environmental topics. It's not just because we're here in the Heinrich Bell systems, but it's where you can find common interests. You know, sort of like you don't, you know, sort of like, you know, environmental problems aren't, you know, ethnically separated. And I do think that uh you know what we you know what can we do to support this more and then just to ra raise another problem again and that which is concerning us a lot is that not just the elite uh you know sort of like are trying to cling on to power but i think you know that's normal because all you know, sort of like all politicians try to cling to power, but the question is more of that, what checks and balances are there to make sure that it respects the rule of law, but in the whole region, uh, you know, sort of like there's also a lot of organized crime and the state capture, as it was called by the European Union, that the web of and connections between organized crime and politics. And this is a problem in the whole region. And I think you know, it, it does uh, apply to the north of Kosovo, which means that a lot of, which leads to the fact that, of, co of course, there are a lot of processes which have to be very slow, very deliberate. It can't be done from one day to the next. But that these processes must, you know, sort of like are being impeded because there are people who are trying to cling on to their own power and their own money. And... Uh, they don't really want people to find a solution or that there should be a democratic um, a democratic rights or a, a powerful civil society or to find a resolution to the con to the conflict because they earn a lot of money and a lot of power due to this conflict and that's a part of the problem but you are right to an extent that it is important uh, chapter 20 chapter 23 24 to 35 we will be we won't be played against in this very clearly. Of course, you're right. Of course, people are saying, you know, of course, you know, sort of like the EU is only interested in 35 and they're not really interested in 23 and 24, which is about democratization and rule of law. And, you know, sort of like people in the representative of the Serbian government say this again. But when you look at the last country report from the European Union, you can see that there are a lot of very concrete, tangible things which talk about the state of the rule of law and democracy. And I think that we always say that uh, one and the other has to be fulfilled and has to be respected in order to complete the accession process, and that both are interdependent. But of course, you are right that it is obvious that sometimes we are, and you know, sort of like our colleagues from Serbia, you know, sort of like, uh, 
you know, they, it's easier to come and to talk about Kosovo than it is to talk about progress within their own country. Uh, when a delegation comes from the, our country or from other countries, you know, sort of like uh, rather than talk about the difficult discussions of uh, justice reform or other political topics. So it is, you know, sort of like sometimes one can have the impression that the politicians are more interested in talking about Kosovo than internal reform. Society, I think, yes, it's, it's extremely important. And Kosovo has a long tradition of, of uh, civil society. Um, it is extremely important now, especially because in a captured state, uh, the, uh, the checks and balances uh, being dysfunctional, the narrative of uh, reason is actually driven to a great extent by civil society, which is, does not have a, a stake in, in power. Um, as an illustration, the, the, as for a year and more now, uh, the Kosovo Foundation for Open Society has been leading a project on, on the question of negotiations and trying to create a consensus with parties to, to an extent successful. Uh, next week, uh, uh, Bodo Weber from, from DPC will be discussing his project that he's been developing for a longer period of time with Serbian NGOs in Kosovo. So there's a dialogue going, if there's an intelligent dialogue going on, is actually within civil society because uh, the, 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 the Serbian party has been basically under direction from Belgrade and the only ones supporting Serbian society in Kosovo on the Serbian side are actually Serbian civil society people who are speaking out loud uh, on on their interests uh, uh, on on how they see the future, so it is. Uh, I think it is very very important to to further support it in in that direction. I would agree that civil society is probably the only way to push the governments to abide with the adopted uh, laws and uh, criteria and so on. But I think it's even more important to engage in uh, reforming the educational system, which I'm afraid is not in the focus of the EU negotiations. And this is exactly where I would start, the starting point, to sort of uh, uh, adopt certain uh, set of values which young people would be brought up upon, and also accountability. Uh, and as you probably know, Serbia is denying any kind of uh, responsibility for what has happened in the wars and the way she treats uh, war criminals who come back home uh, only to say how deep moral problem we have. So, I mean, these are two, I would say, most crucial things for our society. Moral defeat or moral devastation and accountability. So if this would be addressed properly, and it is not, I would say, um, there were many initiatives dealing with the past, but somehow when we talk about Serbia, others as well, but Serbia primarily, we don't have a starting point for that because uh, uh, we are pretending to be on equal basis with others, but we are responsible for starting the war. And, you know, there are many other things which uh, Serbian elites we have, will have to deal with. And I would say the chapter 34 is the key uh, for democratization, both of Serbia and Kosovo, so it cannot be ruled out from the negotiations. I think it would be done. It should be done with first, and then continue with the others. But okay, well, at least this is parallel in this process. And I think uh, this is exactly why Belgrade is sort of rejecting this kind of uh, discussion, Chapter 35, because they hope that. Uh, things may change along the lines that I have mentioned earlier. This is the change of borders, not only in Kosovo, but also in, uh, in Bosnia and uh, Montenegro. So uh, it's a much deeper problem. Serbia is defeated, but it's not defeated morally, and still it got half of Bosnia. And you know, the, the major mistake was made with Bosnia in Dayton Agreement, in Dayton, because uh, it installed ethnical ethnic principle. So everybody is now referring to this kind of agreement, which is wrong. And I'm afraid it is already applied in many other places, which will only generate this mistake that has been made in 95. Um, also, my question was teilweise schon
Okay, my question was answered to some extent, but this is a question that is just to complete some gaps in my knowledge. I would like to know the geopolitical interest in the region that uh, play a role in the conflict. You've already talked about the role of Russia. We can already see in the Middle East where sometimes there are cultural interests in supporting a conflict or can sometimes uh, be an impediment to or an obstacle to solving things. Is there a multinational or regional solution or a bilateral solution? What's your take on things? My name is Behrens. I work for the last 20 years on a voluntary basis in the EU program, new, con new construction in the southeast of Europe and various countries in the West Balkan region. And uh, I think we are probably all agreed that this uh, exchange of territory question is a, is a distraction, is a show, and that the the, you know, sort of like the question that uh, Mr. Kaufman asked, uh, that the main, the main question that we haven't really dealt with is the question of how these countries, uh, what's the relationship to the EU, what's their attitude to the EU process? And I think you went into it briefly. Uh, you know, sort of like the uh, construction of the rule of law. The, the but it's been, I think it's under, it's not dealt with enough in the uh, discussions. We've also talked about a Marshall Plan uh, that, you know, sort of like that our solution is that the car for uh, the K4, F K4 is costs nearly as much as a Marshall Plan, but isn't a Marshall Plan. And I think, you know, we need a K4, you know, sort of like, how would you have a properly functioning car for? What, what, how would you imagine this? Thank you, Toby. Uh, I'm, I'm in the, from the, Euro the European uh, Commission. Uh, um, you've already dealt with this to some extent, but the, the question of education, education on history, and, you know, sort of like how one can introduce educational reforms. And, you know, sort of like the European Council is the completion of the Marshall Plan. You know, sort of like 1947 was the Marshall Plan and then 1949. Uh, exactly 70 years ago, we had the European Council. And, uh, you know, sort of like we can see that, you know, sort of like, you know, sort of like training, education on the Holocaust, education on history. And how do we talk about history? How do we deal with history? What do we talk about the history and the Holocaust? And how do we talk about democratic standards and education? And I would plead for the fact that we really need to see what we can do because all of the members are there, or at least sort of like the, they've signed the European Cultural C Convention. And so there is competence there. We don't have jurisdiction for education and history. We only have a support, uh, we only have a support uh, function for the European Union, but we can make sure that people can talk to one another and we can negotiate. And of course, then we could do this together with the EU and then also then for the European, uh, the European Commission and its uh, strategy, the flagship project, the flagship, flagship project six is this chapter on working processing of history, youth movements, and to think about how uh, what, how can we do with the, the how can we work with this uh, area in the future? And how can we deal with all these topics? And what do you think about what we can do and how we can help? Then it's a common effort and just a last remark on this. And we have to think ourselves into this process. And the, you know, in the, in the Heinrich Paul Stiftung and the Greens, we had a, we had a big problem with the Kosovo war. And the 20 years that have happened are a common history. And we have to help with reconstruction. We have to help with European integration. And then the Germans, the French, and other European, uh, we have to work together with and discuss with uh, the people in the West Balkan region about what worked and what didn't work. To what you say, because I would just like to mention that there are ongoing um, 
uh, projects in the region which are dealing with the history. Recently, there was Clio Fest in Zagreb and many other cities throughout Croatia, History Fest in Sarajevo, which gathered about 100 people from the region. And also we as a committee have this uh, uh, project on history of Yugoslavia, which is funded by German ministry. So, and I think our project uh, gathered about 50 historians from the whole region. I think there are enough people now at this moment which can deal with the issue objectively, but it takes still time. This is younger generation of historians, 30, 40, and some older, who are now ready to engage in this kind of analysis and research. So there is, a, I'm optimistic about it, but it still takes time. And I think it's very important that these projects be supported because they're not supported from the states we come from, unfortunately. So, uh, and this is, uh, ex and I would say Council of Europe has uh, conducted uh, history uh, projects with the whole Balkans. Uh, as a result, we have this uh, history textbook for the teachers, but it is not used in the region. It's in the cellars. So, I mean, there are many efforts which have been made, uh, but unfortunately, they are not yet mainstream, I would say, teaching. So. I, I'm really optimistic about that, but I think many other things have to be clarified before they come to the main, how should I say, as a mainstream uh, approach to the history. To the classroom? Yes. <laughs> not, no, it's not only classroom. Media, public space in general. It's not only classroom. On the question of, of our relationship to the EU, it's, a, it's, it's two sad love stories. Uh, Kosovars in the majority love the EU, but the EU doesn't love it back. Uh, it's, uh, well, it's five countries that have not recognized uh, Kosovo, so it's not entire love yet. Uh, and vice versa, uh, EU is offering love to Serbia, but there are less less people in Serbia who love uh, the EU back. So these are paradoxes in, in the love affair that need to be uh, resolved uh, in the future. I th well, to get a bit more serious, the, uh, the question is that in all probabilities, the, relation, the magnetic uh, um, attraction of the EU will not be as transformative as it has been for other countries, for other societies. And if that happens to be in the future, then that puts even more pressure on our societies actually to, to try to invent processes of uh, not only reconciliation, but creation of intercommunication that would be more satisfactory, that would be replicating a bit of what the EU could be doing. That is an enormous project, but if it were initiated by our societies, I think it would require an enormous support from uh, the European Union. And Two, to your question of memory, there's been a lot of work being done in this country on memory, of course. It's a leading country on, on memory. And one concept that has emerged here in Germany is transformative memory. And this is something that is very important in our societies. It is how to get a shared transformative memory in a conflict. The problem is the conflict has not finished yet. No, so how do you integrate memory when it is not memory yet? And this is a big uh, question mark uh, for our societies. What is very important is that the issue of reconciliation, I think upon German insistence, I suppose, or German initiative, has entered uh, the part of the Berlin process as, as a necessary benchmark, uh, if you will. What we need to do is expand further on that, that reconciliation means also shared transformative memory. So I'll talk about geopolitics. I think that the biggest uh, geostrategic interest in an, in an integration of the West Balkan region into the EU is the EU itself. And so I don't think that it's so good, but you know maybe it is relevant. The soft underbelly, uh, you know, of the EU, you know. You know the, you know, sort of like we would talk about it as our back, you know, as our, as our back garden. You know, sort of like if you look at, 
It's the sort of like, it's not the back garden, but it's the central garden of the European Union, if you look at it. So we do have a political and strategic and security interest uh, in uh, integrating the countries of the West Balkan region. And, and that's the rationale behind the Euro European politics. I don't think, you know, I don't think that the West Balkans are, you know, sort of like the big game where it's the big game territory, you know, sort of like where a lot of the big powers confront one another. But the, but, but there are others who don't have as big expectations as us. We want a complete transformation, and that's the real heart of things. And but, you know, it's I think it's a failed transformation. We have to see how we start it off properly. And the strategy of the commission needs uh, uh, b needs approaches that really need to be in integrated and implemented, not just remain on paper. But are there other factors that are that have singular interests, or maybe sort of like you know maybe religious or economic interests, like China or the Arab states? Yeah, you know, maybe they could play a role. But it's but the you know sort of like the EU doesn't really have a big player against it. You know. Uh, at least, you know, sort of like this is the perspective of the foreign minister. But maybe the security, I don't think that we recognize enough the security and the political importance that this region had for us. And I think that sometimes we're not courageous enough when it comes to dealing with it. And in particular, when it, we're talking about the implementation and the respect of promises. Yeah, just a question. I'm just uh, coming back to this boring question again. The freedom of, for visas, but we have to get this on the table. I know the arguments, I know the politics, I know the difficulties, um, you know, sort of like in Germany here to explain, to explain to their own citizens and to others why this country needs uh, visa freedom and sort of like in, the liberty to integrate and shouldn't have to wait so long. but. Uh, how, nevertheless, I am of the the opinion, you know, 20 years ago, I never th would have thought that it would have lasted so long. And I was 19 and I was lucky enough to be in Germany that 20 years later, after the war, that we still don't have the possibility to, we haven't still got, you know, sort of like liberty to travel in so far as that we've got um, the freedom to travel with visas. And, you know, sort of like things are, st there is a sticking point. And I think that there are a lot of things to, there are a lot of potential there to not just the liberty to travel with visas, but also a visa free deal. But we really need, uh, we really need, you know, sort of like to find a solution with these countries, and in particular with Kosovo. I think we're much too withdrawn. We're much too. What we keep, the, you know, sort of like we leave the criminals just, you know, have free reign where they are. And I've done my homework on this topic, or see, not if not, then I just have, you know, pr private interest in the topic. But, but the we shouldn't keep youth as as hostage. Uh, you know, there are a lot of criminals there and a lot of corruption there. You know, it's very open in these countries. You know, in our countries, it's more subtle or it's not so open. But there, it's really, it's practiced openly. Uh, we've, I don't really need to talk more about this here. A lot of people, there are people who are a lot more specialist, specialized than I am. But there's a lot of potential there. And I think that we're much too hesitant with uh, respect to developing this potential. Thank you very much for this. I think that was very important for me, and so I'm very happy that this it wasn't a question, it was a statement, I would have said. So for people who don't know, the Kosovo don't have a visa-free deal still to travel within Europe. Serbia, yes, and the other parts of ex-Yugoslavia, but Kosovo is the one part, is the, is the one part you know, so like especially has an excess of very young population who don't have freedom of travel. And so is there anybody who wants to say something about this? I think you're the only person who can say something. And and so the, you know, you're here as the Foreign Office, so you're a little bit responsible for this as well. 
you know, I can only agree. I personally think that it's absurd when the health ministry were talking about people, you know, sort of like the nece the necessary, you know, sort of like, you know, sort of like in order to, we use uh, Kosovo nurses to sort out the problems in our hospitals, for example. And at least they're looking at countries that have an excess, not necessarily an excess, but has a positive democratic trend and have a lot of young people who sort of like who are unemployed. And I think when then it's not just doing damage to the country, but when you sort of like, you know, you know, sort of like when 1.8 million Kosovo people cannot fr don't have free travel. And we could also be able to bring them to us in order to take care of our young and sick folk. So I can only agree with this. But on the other hand, for, for me, the secret is how can you get a population to this? Because the, the politicians, not just our politicians, but also the politicians there, how can you, you know, sort of like that, you know, sort of like the train has now left the station. And when the train left, then, pe you know, people didn't get on board at the time. And now that the train has departed and it's very hard to catch the next train. This is a reality. I don't think it's good and I don't think it's I don't think it's justified. Um, from a material point of view, and we've seen some positive mood. We've got a working group on this. And last week, there was a, dele there was a delegation from Kosovo with us in the in interior ministry. And we were talking about the we were talking about this. We put things on the table and negotiated things. But but you know, it's sort of like at the moment, the Netherlands government is starting an initiative at the European Commission to have visa free travel for Albanians. And it's, it's not, it's, you know, sort of like, it's not positive conditions, you know, sort of like, you know, they haven't even managed to get involved on the European uh, level. I also have the same questions and also from foreign policy sort of view, how can we build up connections to the region and how can we support positive developments in a region, in a country? Uh, of course, visa-free travelers, of course. Um, but this is, there are other things that we can be done. But the question, uh, the question has to be addressed to the politicians in their own country. How did they not manage to? How did they not manage to attain what the others did? You know, sort of like you know, the Ukraine with 64 million people, they've managed to get visa-free travel. But in this small country, uh, how did they not manage to get this done? And you know, what did you do badly that the others did properly? Uh, how would, how were you not able to convince people properly? And I think. It's, this is not just to do with the non-recognition. There are also situation, circumstances in Kosovo themselves which led to the fact that this wasn't introduced. So, of course, it is. Uh, I think it's also related to successful transformation. If one, you know, sort of like we can talk about responsibilities, if we make this more clear within the countries and we send this message back to the government, and we. So, Mr. Bissako, do you want to say something else on this? Or no? But I think that that was really the statement that we needed at the end. It was something material, something practical. It was very important. It's also something that's uh, close to my heart. And I think this is something that we could do, which is material. And thank you all for this uh, long, uh, warm evening. And uh, for, thank you for your participation. And. We also have, you know, we also have uh, events where there are a lot of, uh, pe not so many people come, and I wish uh, Serbia and Kosovo much uh, positive progress in the further reconciliation process and with their integration into the European Union. And I hope that we can talk about progress and not just about continuous uh, blockages. And I wish you all a very happy evening.